Okay, Patrick, we're live. Um, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. So this is Patrick McGinnis. I'm trying to think of how to describe you. I mean, the, the byline you always see is you coined the term FOMO um, while you're a student at Harvard Business School. And since then, you've written a couple books, you've started podcast, um, investing, advisory, all sorts of stuff. So uh, most importantly to me is that you've been an amazing mentor and guide and resources have gone through this entrepreneurship, you know, author idea entrepreneurship journey. It is very hard, but you're doing great. So it's been, <laughs> it's really nice to be here. Um, and I'm also a person who took a sabbatical up as we'll be talking about today. Yes. So um, yeah, let's, let's start there. Tell me about your life leading up to, to your sabbatical. Yeah. So I, uh, was working on Wall Street in a very intense investing job, doing kind of like emerging markets investing, traveling um, a lot. So, you know, everybody travels a lot, of course, in like finance and private equity, but my travel was like kind of extreme. It, would, it wasn't like I went to Cleveland every week for three days. It was like I went to Pakistan for 10 days, then connected through the Philippines, and then, you know, came back to New York, that kind of stuff. So it was a lot of Pakistan, Turkey, Colombia, um, other places like China. And I enjoyed it immensely, actually. It was a lot of fun. And, um, but it was very taxing, actually, on me. I didn't really realize that. But um, what happened was I was working for a division of AIG in the run-up to the financial crisis when AIG blew up in 2008. I don't know. I had like a stress reaction to that that actually gave me what they thought was mono. They didn't know quite what was wrong with me, but I was like all messed up. And I was very sick. I, at one point, I was on a heart monitor. And during that experience of suffering and, and um, being sick for months, um, I was very unhappy. And I sort of like just thought to myself, like, what have I done? You know, I've made a, a massive career blunder by working at this company that blew up now i'm sick and you know everything that i thought i had you know like being the harvard mba and all this stuff like none of it worked out and so i actually um when i was still working i took this vacation and i went to india for two weeks and before i went to india i can tell you that i'd had blurry vision for like three or four months i was constantly fatigued it was bad and i swear to god when i was in india uh, something changed. I got back off the plane when I came back and I felt normal again. And mm. so that was kind of like a, that was a vacation, but that was the beginning of my thinking, like I need to take a break. And so that became a process of me planning to take a sabbatical of indeterminate length. So uh, just to stop you there, did you, was that the longest you'd ever taken off or was there something particularly special about that time? So no, I'm always good about taking my vacations. I was always, I always found a way to take a little extra because like they never counted in my job. So I'd be, I booked like five weeks a year of vacation. Um, but no, I think the difference was that I was really just, so because my company had blown up, I just didn't care. And so I really didn't do a lick of work for the entire trip. And I think <laughs> that was a big difference. And then also I went, you know, it was kind of an interesting trip because I went and stayed at the Taj in Mumbai right after the attacks at that hotel. So that hotel was like half closed and smelled like smoke. And I just thought somebody should support the staff and go stay there. And so I did. And um, that was like 2008, 2009, right? Yeah. 2009, precisely. Yeah. Uh, two, the attack was 2009. My trip was 2000. Yeah, that's right. 2009. And so, um, you know, seeing that, you sort of say like, well, my problems, while they're big to me, you know, they're not as bad as a lot of other people. So I think that perspective was also really helpful. And that's what travel gives us, of course. So how, and I just saw a note from, uh, from another Mainer, Aaron Chadbourne. Oh, Aaron Chadbourne. But so coming, coming from, uh, from growing up in Maine, how did you, like this job where you were traveling and working in finance and traveling all over the world, was that something that you wanted to do or is that something you just ended up doing? How did you decide no. what you wanted to do and how you wanted to work? I, so I grew up in, as we said, in the small town of Maine where our friend Aaron is from as well. 
And uh, I studied my undergraduate degree at Georgetown in the School of Foreign Service. And so I had never left the States, actually. Uh, I hadn't even been in Canada. I had seen the border. But when I studied abroad in Argentina my junior year, um, I got the scholarship from the Rotary Foundation. And I went, I had never left America, and um, which scared the heck out of me. But when I got to Argentina, I loved it. And so I fell in love with Latin America and I decided I wanted to build my career in Latin America. So my job, first job out of school was Latin American private equity um, mm -hmm. and venture capital at JP Morgan. And then after business school, uh, I got a, I couldn't find a job in Latin America because it was very kind of out of favor at the time. So I got a job investing in the US and I went from like flying to Buenos Aires and Sao Paulo to flying to rural Ohio, which nothing wrong with that, but it didn't excite me. And so um, after six months, I took a nap under my desk one day and I thought, I really need to get out of here. And I managed to find this job in the international in the investing um, group at AIG that wasn't just Latin America, but it was global, which was mm -hmm. amazing in terms of, you know, expanding my sort of reach uh, intellectually and professionally. It just was a lot of travel, which I would never do like that again. And just because I was I was speaking, as we were talking about in the green room, I was speaking to Abby Falek from from Global Citizen Year earlier. And, you know, they kind of do these gap year, like programmatic gap years, right? Do you feel as though the experience that you had having this lifestyle and travel and work is something that you would recommend to someone? Or because obviously you, you kind of had to come to that realization it wasn't for you ultimately, but also seemed to give you international exposure and business experience. And also it gave you maybe an illness that you had to take off to cure. Like, would you recommend that to a friend? I think the thing about that kind of career is that in the beginning, it is wonderful. Like I was able to travel all over the place. Um, I have lots of miles still. And, you know, I, I, I speak a number of languages, so I was able to perfect my languages and um, I met amazing people and it was interesting and fun. But it is very lonely because, you know, you travel to some place and you're some hotel you, you know, you make friends with your coworkers, but like they're not, you know, people that you're, you know, they're your coworkers, right? And then you come home, and this is what I see with everybody who travels a ton. You come home and the world has continued without you. And so it mm -hmm. takes you a while to get back into the swing of things. And so you're constantly socially um, disconnected. And yep. now that I don't, I mean, I, tr I traveled, I still travel, of course, we all travel, but like now that I'm much more rooted, I think I see myself as, um, I see the benefits of that. So I still like to travel and go places and, and stuff like that. And I find it exciting, but it's not a grind. At some point when you're like, this is my seventh trip to Istanbul in a year. It's just like, you're, I mean, you know, it, it's, it gets old. Yeah, no, that, I mean, you're, you're kind of describing the experience that I had with, with my startup um, although I didn't really come out with a lot of miles because we were buying, you know, we'd fly on like some, <laughs> some rinky dink airline to save money as opposed to, you know, on AIG's dime. But, um, where I think you have these acute moments where you feel like this is too much, right? So an illness in your case, or some sort of crisis that, that you miss. And then I think what started to wear on me was just this gradual feeling that, as you said, you get back and everyone else's life has kind of moved forward. And, you know, you're not being invited to things because folks are like, well, I assumed you were traveling and you see this like slow degradation of your, your social structure. Um, and that's like harder to, to kind of plant a flag and say like, okay, enough is enough. I need to change my lifestyle. But um, yeah, but the thing too, is that it becomes part of like your whole like social profile. It's like, oh, Patrick, he's always on the road. And you kind of, there's like a cachet to it because it, from the outside, it looks so glamorous, but like, is it, I mean, is flying business class glamorous? I get, I'm not really, right? It's, it's not like you sleep all that well. It's like you can watch movies at your house, right? So yeah, it's, it's all, it's FOMO, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so take us back to, to you have some sort of illness. You're, you're kind of like in bed. What's, what's the next step? So I made this covenant with God. You know, I'm a Catholic, so we like the covenants. And I was like, God, <laughs> if I make it through this, I'm going to change some things about my life. And so um, I was, when I sort of recovered, let's say I started getting, I got sick in like September. I felt much better in March-ish. 
my God. And I remember, um, you know, I got strong. Like I started running all the time and I got in really good shape. And so I felt good. And I was like, well, I feel strong now. It's time to make changes because I'm very miserable. Our firm was like up for sale. And, you know, we were, the company was so traumatized. Everybody was so embittered. And I just was like, this is not a good environment for me. I'd get up in the morning and I would, by the time I made it to the, I'd be like relaxed when I left my house. And by the time I got to the elevator at our office, I was seething with rage at the situation which is not healthy. I mean, who wants to live like that? And so I just was like, no more. This is, I've done more than I ever thought I would have done as a kid growing up. I made more money than I ever thought I would have made. Not that I made like gazillions, but I was like, this is more money than I expected to make. And yet I'm not happy at all. I'm miserable and angry and cynical. I'm done. And so that was the decision. So I did, I remember it very clearly. I had this, um, I had bought myself one of those, um, those beautiful, um, leather bound notebooks by that what's the not mon, moleskin. Mono, moleskin i bought myself a moleskin and i think it was bright red i thought it'd be bold or something and um i was like this is my big idea place and i um i started taking notes about how i would quit my job and that was the rationale of what i would tell mm -hmm. my boss and then it was also like my finances and like how long i do it for like just kind of making those plans I was very focused on the economic aspects of this, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, how can I survive? Thankfully, I had saved and saved and saved. My parents were savers. They taught me to save. So I knew financially I had a lot of runway, but also what did I want to do with the time? And so I started imagining, I should find that actually, because it really was like putting those ideas on paper in a public park in the West Village was the beginning of that. And I never mm -hmm. thought, this was like, to me, this was so radical um, yeah. that I did. And you didn't have anyone in your life who had, who had taken that, like your family hadn't done it growing up. So it was just kind of your idea. Yeah. I, the, the feeling that I had was I don't believe in this company anymore because it's, you know, it's like we were part of the government. I, I don't believe in, um, I'm kind of cynical about at the moment. I was like very cynical about capitalism as a whole, which like I've come back and I think I've reconnected in a much more constructive way, but I was like, you know, I was like working for AIG during the financial crisis. We had all these people who, who were bad actors who got guaranteed bonuses to stay and like mm. they cut our bonuses. And I was sort of like, this whole system is rigged and I don't want to be a part of it anymore. Like maybe I'll just, I don't know, you know, <laughs> climb a mountain uh, and then uh, go, go join Occupy Wall Street. And then I was like, this, this also physically made me sick yeah. and I'm done. And I also watched all my friends from business school who had gone to work at Facebook and all these tech companies. Like the tech sector did not slow down during the financial crisis. Yeah. So I was like, man, I'm chasing yesterday's dream. All mm -hmm. these other people I know did the thing that was risky and they're now, you know, killing it. So all of that together just made me feel like I had to get out of there. But I, I didn't even like, to be honest, like I don't even know if I thought about it as sabbatical per se until I got into it. And then as I started to really think about it, I remember being like, well, where can I read about this? And there's like, there were no good resources because you hadn't come along yet, right? And so I was yeah. very much, and like nobody I knew had done this. People looked at me like I was nuts. So it was definitely like a very, um, let's say, experimental phase of my life. And so when you were thinking about like mapping this stuff out and thinking about money, and yeah, if you if you're able to pull up that moleskin, that would be that would be awesome. I'm but gonna find it. Were you thinking about? hey, I want to have this amount of runway or like how, how did you kind of structure it? So I think one of the interesting things about folks on sabbatical, at least my learning, you know, I went to New Zealand. I was there for six weeks. I bought a motorcycle. I sold it for the same amount of money. You know, I was camping most days. And so just my burn rate went down to almost zero, right? Um, and so it not only allowed me to like extend the amount of time that I would be off, but it also changed the way I thought about money and the, the relationship between money coming in and money going out um, in a way that has stuck with me. So how, how are you thinking about it at that time or how has it evolved over time? Yeah, this, is, this was really interesting because I thought one thing and I lived another and then I learned something else. So my original thing, so I had saved and saved and saved for years and years and years. I never lived extravagantly. Um, I lived fine, but um, I had a great apartment that was rent stabilized. So like I had, this is going to sound a little crazy, but I think I had six or seven years of runway. Mm -hmm. um, 
because I just at, had savings at like so, at like an estimate of your your spending or like, like an estimate of a reduction of spending. No, nah, kind of like living. I kind of knew. I mean, like I was like, if I don't change anything radically, I can kind of go for a long time. Yeah. Now, that was my sense. You know, like again, that had some implicit assumptions. But so I was like, okay, I'm good to go. Um, and I didn't only plan to take like three months or six months or something. Once I got into it. Um, I realized that it didn't really matter because first of all, I did cut expenses. Like I was able to sublet my apartment and to stay in Europe. I went to Europe for, for, for like three months and two months. And I like did apartment swaps with people who were friends of friends. Mm-hmm. So I, I started to get super crafty about like how to cut expenses and stuff. In the beginning, I didn't care. I was like, just wanted to live my best life. And I was like super happy and spending money like normally. But over time, two things happened. Number one is I started to recognize that even if you have plenty of savings, dipping into your savings is a horrible feeling. You go to dinner with your friends and you're like, it's a hundred dollars. And you're like, geez, like that's a lot of money. And I have not. You're like, I didn't get an appetizer. Can we subtract that? Exactly. And split it? Itemize, please. <laughs> that's number one. And number two is like, I started to realize that, and this was like interesting too. It's like a lot of, I used to spend money quite liberally as a stress relief, be like, go to the J crew and buy all this crap I didn't need or whatever. Yeah. Um, and the minute that I left that stressful work situation, I didn't feel the need to spend money as a stress relief. So I, my kind of burn yeah. went down. Interesting. Yeah. So, how, okay. So tell us, step back and just tell us what you did and you know, you can kind of decide to put the balance on what was sabbatical, what wasn't, but um, how did it go? So a couple of things happened when I decided to leave my job. Um, it was a big decision. I really struggled. I mean, I was so nervous. I had to have a whole playlist of music to pump me up for it. Like every time I've quit a job, I've had to like, listen to like, uh, I've had to make a special playlist cause I'm so, I hate that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, uh, what's on the Number playlist one, you can't just skip over uh, that. one day more from <laughs> lame is a rob you listen to it the day before <laughs> and then the theme from san Elmo's fire um which is the georgetown like unofficial song stuff like that <laughs> um nothing like no angry songs it's more aspirational inspirational uh anyway i went to talk to my boss and he was super cool and he said like okay i know you're gonna leave if you stay on for more time kind of extend your time with us we can come into an agreement where you can stay on and, and continue helping us kind of as a consultant. And so that was amazing because I kept the parts of my job that I truly loved. I stayed on working mm-hmm. on some projects that I loved. And, um, and so that also provided a little bit of income. And so that was like a huge, I really like appreciate that to this day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> then I was like, what am I going to do with this time? And there were two things that happened that were very informative. Number one is right after I quit my job and I was on my sabbatical, uh, actually right before my last day, I took a trip to Argentina and spent two weeks in Patagonia and nature. And so that was just like a nice little, you know, kind of like transition. But when I started Mm -hmm. back in New York, I remember I had lunch with my brother the next week and he said, Patrick, you should get up every day for three months, not knowing what you're going to do that day. And I said, oh, Michael, that is such a crazy. It's just not who I am. Mm-hmm. And I ended up doing it for like nine months. And uh, it was for me, uh, maybe six months, but for me, that deep programming from the daily kind of schedule that I was in and all of the stuff that I thought I cared about and really getting outside of that and enjoying the flexibility and autonomy, like that was a very important deep programming. Now, the other thing that I did um, that was really uh, good during that time is I, I kind of did like things that were just about like getting me into a better headspace. Cause I was still deeply traumatized from the financial crisis. I felt very bitter and angry. So one thing I did, it was like, I watched every game of the 2010 world cup, like every one. I would sit at the street. There was like a TV at the end of my street in New York city at this cafe, they put it outdoors and I would get up. It's like seven in the morning in the morning. They like, just sit there for like six hours and invite <laughs> friends and just like, be part of that. It made me so happy. And the other thing is I was, I remember right around the time I quit, um, I saw the movie Vicky Cristina Barcelona on a plane. And mm-hmm. I just decided to go to Barcelona because I always, I speak Spanish, <laughs> always love uh, Barcelona. I have friends in Barcelona. And so I reached out to some friends and I did apartment swaps 
and I spent a bunch of time there. And so that whole thing, just like by the time I got back from Spain at the end of the summer, because like March, the end of the summer, I was really, I was, I, I felt amazing. Um, I felt hopeful about the state of the world. Um, my eyes had been open to the fact that I really valued autonomy and flexibility in a new way. Mm -hmm. And um, I just kind of had recharged my batteries, probably the most charged they had been in, like, I don't even know, since college or something. And, and how long was that, was that period? Mm, it would be April, May, June, July, August, say five, six months. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm putting up a message from David, who I played soccer with in high school, so he would understand the World Cup the world cup thing. Um, what most of the world knows is that you don't have to quit your job in order to just watch every world cup game. It's just it destroys the, each country's economy <laughs> for that, for that month and a half. It's um, very true. One, one question about that. The first point though, um, you'd already said that you had, you know, six, seven years of runway. Like what, like why did you take that continuation and that consulting? Was it, was it about making yourself feel better about the decision, like emotionally, because you already knew intellectually or what, what was that? I think for me, it was two things. Number one is I did really love my job. And I, so I was working with the companies that I had worked with as an investor and I wanted to see them through. And so, and I loved my colleagues. And so to be able to continue on with these people that I liked on these investments, I liked in a way that was flexible, like it was very light on, you know, that was not time intensive. Um, was great. Number two is um, obviously income is great. Uh, we always want, you know, money coming in the door. So it made me feel a bit more safe. And I think number three is from a resume perspective, like I, you know, I could, it wasn't like I was just like, and I think this is like an, at the time, I guess this mattered more to me. Now I, I you know, I understand a bit differently, but I was really worried about having a gap on the CV. And so mm -hmm. I thought, well, this is kind of resume cover. Now, it never hurts, but I think the other thing is that, like, I was, I didn't realize yet that I would never go back to a corporate job. And so it didn't really matter. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel like that's changed broadly since then in the last 10 years? Listen, I think that the corporate world, uh, so it's a good question because I have seen friends, like once you're out of the, out of the game, getting back into it is, is, can be difficult, especially if you've been you know, not working for a while. That being said, the world of work has changed that so many people, when they leave a corporate job, you know, you set up your LLC, yeah, you do some consulting work, you create a brand around it. And, you know, that has become a very accepted thing. I think uh, that that's for sure. And I've also seen friends of mine who, you know, look, they, they're going to work for, for a year or two. And then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. you know, through some hard work, they're able to reinvent themselves. And I'm always amazed. So, it's, it definitely is easier, I think, if you have a cohesive story. But I think part of what we are, what you have to do and part of what's become more acceptable is like your story nowadays isn't just like going from one big corporate to another. In fact, people value when you've had experiences that are um, non-traditional because the, the, the way that you learn to hustle when you work for yourself, I'm, it's amazing, right? I never could hustle like I, could, like I can now um, when, yeah. I was in, when I was at J.B. Morgan. So on the, on the piece of deprogramming, so taking your brother's advice and mm. not knowing what you're going to do, obviously it may be a little bit easier in a place like New York because there's like so many random things going on at any given time. But like, how, would, how did your emotions do over that, that period of time? Because I can imagine it's, it's really easy to you know, sit on the couch in pajamas and watch Netflix. And um, it's hard to like, actually put yourself out there and explore. So I'm not a person who watches that. Like I would never be that couchy person. Um, mm. That's just not who I am. But <laughs> the thing is, this is what I always tell people when they leave a job um, and take time off or whatever, sabbatical. Um, it's like the first period of time you quit your job or you leave your job. And like you every day, it's like, It'll be like 1.43 p.m. And all of a sudden you will be overcome with a deep sense of joy, like <laughs> profound within you, as if like there was a light emanating from your soul, right? And maybe it happens again at like 7.53 p.m. 
And then the next day it happens. And like that happens for a period of time, maybe a month or two. And then that doesn't happen anymore because like anything else, we become accustomed to where we are in our lives. And so there's that, that euphoria of like, I'm free. Um, and then you're like, wow, I'm busy. You're like, I don't have a job. And yet somehow I fill my days with, you know, a, it's a crazy how one fills one's days. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very unstructured. And then after a period of time, then it starts, you know, and it's oftentimes external, but then it becomes internal. Oh, so thinking about a new job, what are you going to do? Oh, like, so like how long you take off and then you start to hear that voice in your head that voice of self-doubt and concern and what if i don't find it what should i do with my life and so for me it went from being highly enjoyable to then being sort of anxiety driving like after six months yeah and what i found too is that like um you know the reality is even when you work for yourself as an entrepreneur if i've always struggled with like oh i have no meetings today like you know i worked all day saturday it's tuesday i have no meetings like really, I should just give myself the day off and go yeah. do whatever I would have done on the weekend. But of course, now I'm like, well, should I be like trying to do this or that? And so it becomes this whole internal struggle about am I using my time well? And yeah. I think that is like the biggest. And so I've seen friends of mine. I had a friend took a sabbatical. She was like, I'm taking a sabbatical. I'm changing careers. Three months in, she starts freaking out and looking for a job exactly like the one she left. Yep. Yeah. And like the closer you are, to the thing you were doing before, the more your job opportunities are going to look similar to what you're doing before, right? Oh, yeah. Your your network, your opportunities, like that's how people know you and think about you. Um, so that that distance is important. And I think to get away from that FOMO, if that's what you think it, it is, getting that geographic distance is super important, right? Oh, so yeah. from what I understand, you wrote, did you write your last book in Mexico City? I wrote of both it? of my books in places where I would not be disturbed. The first yeah. one, and I, and I write books really quickly. I act like a book is an investment banking project where I, like, I have to do it. I work really hard for like a month to six weeks. And I know it sounds crazy, but it seems to work. And my mm -hmm. first one I wrote in the month of January in Portland, Maine. So like mm -hmm. I had forgotten because I moved away. It snows every day. It was insane. Um, it's really snowy. <laughs> it's beautiful. I was like, wow. Uh, and the second I wrote in Mexico city. Um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, it's like, I need to just be heads down. And that allowed you to just not know kind of what was going on. So you didn't feel bad about missing it. And then like be out of like a routine. I mean, I, I find that being in a different, like a very different time zone is really helpful because then there's not even people up to distract you, right? Like the majority of your network. Um, which obviously is more a little bit more complicated if your network's all around the world. But um, okay, so how did did you call it a a wrap at the end of six months and then start looking for jobs, or how did you kind of demarcate that e exploration period to the next phase in your life? Yeah, I came back. It's funny because I was like, I'll come back in September and figure everything out. I really didn't do. I really just like didn't focus because I was like, I have all the time in the world. And then I came back, and frankly, I didn't know. Um, I started looking at jobs and every job, I just thought I would hate this. And then I interviewed for a few and the people were so odious. I was just like, I'm not working with the, like, I, I, I have been, I extricated myself from a really challenging time. I am not going to work in a situation I'm going to dislike more. Like there's just right. no point to this. What is the point of any of this? And so what I did, um, is I got a WeWork. I the second ever we work, which was in the meatpacking district of New York city. And I just got an office and I would just go there every day and just like try to find stuff to do. And I would start calling people and trying to scare up consulting work and stuff like that. So I had a very piecemeal focus, but for me, it was just important to have a space. I set up an LLC. I set up a website. And part of this was the fact that a friend of mine who I trusted and who was very entrepreneurial, like, he actually kind of said to me, hey, I'm working on this idea for a company. Do you want to work with me? You know, you'll get a percentage of any sales you generate. And he was the one who was like, you need to set up a website. Figure out what you can offer to the world. Set up a website. And so I put up like a little website with my bio and like my you know, quote unquote offering. And, you know, it was just forcing me to add a little structure into my day, um, mm -hmm. into my life in order to start sourcing opportunities. So, okay. So, um well, first of all, I think it's notable that you spent time in two companies that that totally crashed. So, WeWork and also AIG. So, I, also, I, I just bought an NFT, and then the NFTs crashed. So, just be <laughs> careful. 
<laughs> would not be following any investment advice from you today. Um, now, so so let's talk about uh, kind of marrying what you've been working on with FOMO. Let's talk about sabbaticals and FOMO. Yes, I love the question. And I love, I mean, so everybody, just so you know, DJ um, and I, when we met, I had been reading about your work and I was like, this guy is super cool and I love it because I, I wrote a very crappy little thing about sabbaticals for myself when I was working on my first book. And I would just hate, whenever I met somebody who'd quit their job at a party, I would be like, give me your email and I just sent it to them. And then when DJ came along, I was like, oh, they can just go check out his work. It's going to be much more, um, you know, authoritative and substantive than mine. But the, I, the, because my sabbatical was so important and so like restorative for me, um, I really liked that. And so, um, you know, DJ actually wrote like a three part um, blog post at patrickmcginnis.com all about like the intersection and the nexus of FOMO and, and, and sabbatical. So, you know, when I thought about it, it's like people, what is FOMO, right? Let's define FOMO. FOMO is um, an anxiety caused by the perception that there's something better than what you're doing right now, combined with the fear of being excluded from a positive collective experience. Um, so part of that, part of FOMO is about aspiration. I want more, better, bigger, shinier. Um, and part of it's about wanting to be part of the crowd. Now, when you have FOMO that has to do with um, a sabbatical, I think it's really about aspiration. It's like, you know, there is this, I'm going to go do this thing. I'm going to go take a break and it's going to make me a better person, eat, pray, love, all that sort of stuff. But that's all based on the perception. You don't know. You don't know if you're going to enjoy it. You don't know if you're going to find it stressful. You don't, it's like, so it, sabbaticals are always painted as this like vacation where you're going to discover yourself and come up on the other side being like a, a complete person who's like super self-actualized. But that is marketing. Um, and I think the, the important thing to do is to ask yourself like, what do I really want here? And, you know, what am I looking to achieve right now in my life? And if I'm going to do a sabbatical, will that give me what I need? And if I'm going to do the sabbatical and I want these things, like what do I actually have to, what are the components I need to bring in? So if you're like one thing I'll tell you is like, I was looking for stress reduction. I had been super stressed. Um, I should have gone to a meditation retreat. It took me like another 10 years to start meditation. Like I really blew it on that front. Um, thankfully I've found it now, but it's that kind of stuff. And so if that's the power of FOMO, FOMO, gets us to imagine a better world um, that may not really exist and we may not ever be able to conjure. Yeah. I mean, to me, and, you know, I remember someone we interviewed talking about using their sabbaticals as hypothesis testing. Mm. And so, you know, this particular person had this dream to run an eco resort, you know, once, once they retired. And so they used the sabbatical to, go and kind of intern at the eco resort. And what they realized was, oh man, it's basically like the worst parts of running, you know, a hotel and a restaurant combined in a place where it's hard to get, <laughs> like hard to get supplies. And, and so they were able to kind of check that off the, off the list, right? Like they don't have to feel like they're missing out from owning an eco resort because they went and they tried it for a few months and they kind of made their own decision. And so I, I feel like um, you're not totally immune from FOMO because I, I did remember, you know, I did a, like a six week long pilgrimage on mine and, you know, feeling like I was missing my friends and stuff like that. But you're choosing to do the thing that you want to do. And if you can't make that time one that you can't possibly, you know, want to do something else, then you're, you're kind of doing it wrong. Right. Like people should be kind of envying you because you're you're actually having agency as to what you do versus sitting back and watching other people do stuff. Yeah, I mean, FOMO, it's, I, I, so I had this, like, deep, I think deep, I don't know, you guys can tell me. I had what I thought was a pretty deep realization a couple weeks ago. I, I was on vacation, believe it or not, in, in Norway, and I was on the subway in Oslo, listening to a podcast about nostalgia. Somebody wrote a book about nostalgia. And I was like, you know, Patrick, you really blew it because you never thought of this before, but this is, this is the, the thing, is FOMO is nostalgia for the present, mm. right? And, and so that's what happens is like, we cook up this whole book and then once we go out and we 
experience the thing. Like I was, I remember like, I really thought I wanted to be, I mean, this is a, like a hedge fund analyst. Well, like I would hate every minute of that. If you put me in a hedge fund for a week, I would run out the door screaming. Right. But yet mm -hmm. at business school, when, when I was at HPS, it's like, it just is painted out as like the most exciting life. And maybe, maybe it is for you, but like, it's not for me. Um, and so that, that's the kind of stuff. And so there is value to when you have something you want to do. And I talk about this in the, in the book, fear of missing out, I call it going in, um, going all in some of the time you want to run a marathon, go run a 10 K see if you like it before you run the marathon, like do, do a mini version of that thing. And then if it fires you up, great. Yeah, totally. Do you, do you have based on your experience, guidelines for what a sabbatical should be or how you should do it. I remember in the book, you talk about restoration and a roadmap for the future. Yeah. I mean, so I, listen, I, you probably, I mean, this is really your, your wheelhouse. So I wouldn't, you could tell me what, where, where, what you think is, it makes sense as well. But to me, one thing to be important, it's important is for, and from my perspective, it's kind of like meditation. Remember when I started meditating, I had this friend and he was like, how long do you meditate for? I was like, I don't know, 10 minutes a day. Well, that's just not enough. You need to do at least 30 minutes. And if you don't, it doesn't count. And I was like, okay. And I just kept doing my thing because that was good for me. And I saw value in it. This guy, Mr. 30 minutes hasn't meditated for three years. Right. So there is, I think a one size fits all approach with this kind of stuff is so, um, it's, it, it, it doesn't work. Uh, that being said, I think there are some elements that are really critical. And those are number one, having a reason. Number two, financially preparing yourself and understanding the dynamics of that. Number three, pushing yourself into areas that you've always wanted to explore. And, you know, for me, it's like it's restoration and some creativity and just like it's about rediscovering the sense of possibility that you have about life. And so that those were kind of my lodestars. And for me, like. How do I get those? Well, I decided to learn French. I actually started learning a new language. And so I spent time in France and stuff. And, you know, again, apartment swap. It wasn't like I was staying at the Georges Sank or anything, but, you know, I just wanted to like <laughs> do it. Um, and then it was about going places I hadn't been. And it was about not living on a schedule. And it was about being healthy and, um, you know, like taking care. I did a lot of like hanging out in the sun, you know, things like that. And then I, I was, you know, I was in the background really thinking about like, what is the life I want to live going forward? And I think I gathered a lot of data points during that time because I also talked to tons of people. And, you know, once you, it's kind of like if you ever live in New York City and you go into the street at like 3.15 p.m. and you go to like a coffee shop or like Union Square, there's all these people there that aren't working in office towers in Midtown. And you're like, who, who are these people? And so I want to figure that out because I wanted to be one of those people. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, oh man, so many, so many follow-ups from that. But um, when you think about pushing for something like pushing and trying an idea, part of me says, you know, like you're only going to be pushing ideas that the pre-sabbatical self kind of like wanted. So how do you separate what you feel compelled to do versus like what you truly want to do deep down or how you identify that? It's a great question. And I think, listen, we all have those bucket list items. I hate that term, but I'll use it. Uh, things that we wanted to do. I want to go to this place or do this thing or whatever. I want to explore this thing. Um, and so I think it's good to include some of those things, but you also need to leave an unstructured space for that's why I did the thing where I didn't know what I was going to do every day, because what I had learned in my life was I'm really good at just being really intense and working all the time and having a crazy pack schedule. And so I needed to, again, like deprogram myself kind of like, I guess, in the sense, I mean, this is maybe a stretch, so, you know, forgive me. But when you think about like the Buddhist ideal of disconnect, um, I, I don't think I achieved that per se, but it's sort of like, let me just step back. I don't have to be at everything. I don't have to be busy all the time. And so I would just like go sit on the lawn on the West side highway and then like go to the whole foods and like eat a salad and then go back and read a book and like practice doing a headstand, like just random crap every day. But for me, it was like this massive um, way of like 
no longer saying, I don't, you know, this is, I guess like I used to think success means working 65 hour weeks in an office building, traveling all the time, blah, 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 blah. That's what successful people do. And I remember I had friends who like had, they did fine financially, but they had like, didn't work that hard. And I was like, wow, what a loser. Like they're not serious. And then I started to realize like success can look very different and you, you can optimize for different things. And for me, autonomy, yeah, of course you want to make money. That's very important, but like also autonomy. I never thought about, I was like never even considered autonomy as a metric. And then after this period, I was like, autonomy has got to be in the mix. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is going to hit pretty close to home, both for you and me, but I, I'm curious about your answer. So I was just speaking with someone who was talking about the importance of stepping back and kind of questioning your assumptions and like what you're talking about, you know, you, you had never kind of gotten yourself out of the water that was your first kind of career. Right. But now folks like you and I are in this career and you've right. been doing it for a while. Um, how do you like, have you taken a sabbatical? Can you take one from this to challenge the conviction that what you're doing now is what you should continue to be doing? Cause it's yeah, easier it's, when yeah. you're like working on working for someone else or working on someone else's version of, of success. But now that you're doing this. It's a great question. And that is hitting close to home. I'm like, Oh, because I think what happens, especially when you get into like the stuff that you and I do, which is, which is very personal work. Um, and it takes forever for the stuff to happen. And like, you kind of think it's going to be like, uh, I'm going to get that thing. Like I'm going to get the Ted talk. And then all of a sudden I'm going to be like Gary V. Not that I want to be Gary V. Gary V is not, I want to be, he's fine, but it's just not my model. But anyway, <laughs> Adam Grant, whatever. And um, Simon Sinek. And it doesn't really happen that way. You start to realize it's a grind like anything else. Um, and like anything else, you know, cheese is delicious, but if you eat cheese every day for 10 years, you could start to get sick of cheese. And so I have been, um, I could. Uh, Agree to disagree. <laughs> I like, uh, yeah, we'll disagree. I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, so yeah, I had actually thought about that. And I thought about, I actually had a period where I was about to have uh, like an exit on a company. And I was like, when that happens, I'm going to take a break. Um, I'm kind of still waiting for that to happen. So yay. But I just kind of did do a bit of a mini. Uh, I took two weeks and I didn't look at work at all to the point where like people who I didn't email back got mad at me. And I hadn't really done that in a long time. And yeah. what came out of that was a really wonderful discovery, which is like I came out of that with some ideas. I think that what was interesting for me, and this is like all new, so I'm just kind of stream of consciousness for you guys, is I realized that I've been building this thing for 10 years. And while that path is really wonderful, it isn't the only path. And that there are other things that can build on top of it that maybe closer to what I was doing before, I might get involved in a company again in some way or another and keep these things, but also add some other things that I missed from before. And so that was my big takeaway from that experience as I reflected. I was like, I've been doing this for 10 years. What do I love? What do I feel like I'm getting burned out on? And what are the things I want to optimize for going forward? And so that actually brought me into like, I've been looking at some new opportunities based on what I thought about during those two weeks. So that was really valuable. Just having the free space, not to think and not, and also I, you know, another thing I realized I was like, you know, some of the stuff that I used to care about, like how many likes I got, I don't care. Like, I think social media is kind of like, doesn't really drive revenues that much. So like, I want to change the way I do social media to, because I, it's like, wh why am I spending all this time on this thing that isn't actually driving my overall objectives? So those were some yeah. big thoughts that came out of this two weeks that was that, that I just did. That's awesome. I mean, given th this is the thing I always say to folks, like everyone who has taken a sabbatical has taken a vacation, right? And folks, mm -hmm. you know, agree and believe that there's something profoundly different about an extended period of time. So like, I, I guess I'm interested in whether you actually get that big chunk, because I do feel like the two weeks can help reframe kind of what, what we're doing and get some kind of perspective. But there's something different about if you force yourself to do six months and you force yourself to do two months again, where you were not picking up any of the stuff, any of the thoughts that you yeah. have now, um, I wonder what would come out the other side. I'm just, I'm very curious about this. Like it's very easy relatively to go from a job where you're working for someone else 
in a career that you might not have chosen, you kind of like got there via momentum versus something that you felt like is yours and is you. Um, and like separating yourself from that, I think is, is very difficult. Much harder. And, um, much, yeah. much harder. It's so true. It is so true what you say. Like the idea of taking a sabbatical from being you in a sense, like because if your job is like speaking and all the things, um, it's much, much harder. But I, I, I think it is like, um, it's, it's very important and probably something I should figure out how to do. Yeah, I mean, I just, I saw, so Brene Brown's on sabbatical. Krista Tippett is doing a sabbatical from her podcast. I just learned that Chris Anderson from TED is on sabbatical. And so uh, I'm interested, you know, especially um, uh, from Hello Monday, Jesse Hempel was on sabbatical last year. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about, about Jesse, and I think to some extent Krista, is that I think they kind of like stock the pond a little bit with content so that they can be they can be off and it's still you know simmering a little bit. Um, That's for sure. Yeah, I, I think there's like a asynchronicity to to some of this content creation stuff that can allow you to pretend like you're still kind of doing the same thing, but actually be getting this this big refresh. So I'm I'm curious how those folks return to to routine work. Um, but anyway, I'll. Uh, I think I'll Jesse was also writing a book, wasn't with. she? So that yeah, I don't know if that counts, but in a sense it does, right? But yeah, the um, but you're right. Like with the podcast world, you could just you know create content and take a, a break um, for sure. But from the, some of the other stuff, like if you're speaking and stuff, you know, it's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be interesting to run an experiment to see if you put it down, how much does it actually fall off? I know that our our perception is that you disappear, you have a bit of an expiration date. Um, but if you if you could tell like oh it does fall off but it falls off twenty percent and then you kind of do the math and say well is it worth it yeah um, I think would be would be quite interesting but um, cool so so do you have anything else that that you would like to talk about like stuff you're working on doesn't have to relate to sabbaticals but and then I'd love to take a, a few questions we've got some comments that uh, we sure. can address no I would just say listen I um I super enjoyed spending time with you I really love your work. DJ came on my podcast, FOMO Sapiens, uh, which if you're interested in kind of the nexus of decision-making, entrepreneurial thinking, FOMO Sapiens is a show you would likely enjoy. And if you all listen to it, maybe I'll have so many listeners that I'll be able to take a big, long sabbatical from all the revenue. <laughs> but uh, no, that's been a focus area. And um, I would just say, yeah, that, um, you know, you can find me at patrickmcginnis.com if you want to learn more. Cool. And I think I'll, I need to dig up that email that you sent me, the sabbatical reflections, and maybe we can toss it on our website. Um, pictures of your, of your red mole skin. Um, so uh, a couple of questions that came in through the comments and if folks have uh, other questions, please feel free to, to put them up there. But um, Ashraf asks, when's the perfect time for sabbatical? Does it have to be forced or voluntary? What's your, what's your thinking about that? Yeah, it's a great one. So I think this kind of goes to any change in life. Very few people are able to make change without being forced, forced by an external thing, right? Like by some event. And I certainly would have never left my job if it wasn't for the financial crisis, even though I really should have done because like I wasn't going to be the greatest private equity investor. That was not, you know, I was like trying really hard, but it wasn't that good at it. And so I would say anything that you could do yourself uh, will, you will likely do the thing sooner than you would have done if you waited for an external stimuli, stimulus. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we found in our research, I think over two thirds of folks were forced into a sabbatical by a negative event. Um, yeah. I think it's just human nature to not do this sort of thing until it, it you know, a sabbatical takes you, right? I think one of the interesting things about the resignation is that I I suspected that if we ever got out of that that first wave of the pandemic, that it would essentially be like a negative catalyst for a lot of folks to re-examine what work and life was like. And I think that's what we saw with the Great Resignation: is you have this external push of like once you get the microscope out and the magnifying glass and look at your life and what you're spending your time on, um, you know, there's there's cause to kind of reconsider that. So. Yeah. Um, 
So Terrence asks uh, to say more about learning to hustle as a, as a solopreneur. So how did you get that hustle? What's, what's your yeah. advice? Oof. So the solopreneur thing is like, it's never ending hustle and it's hard being a solopreneur. I got to tell you, it can be for the dogs because it, it just never, ever stops. And so what I would, you know, what I learned in that is, and, and this, I talk a lot about in 10% entrepreneur. Number one is when you get that anchor tenant is what I call it. That first client who's reasonably reliable. That's the annoying thing about being a solopreneur is the lack of predictability of stuff vis-a-vis -vis when you get a job, you know, you you can predict your salary for the next 25 years unless you lose your job with this kind of stuff where you're generating income all the time. Like you cannot project anything. It's so irritating. And so I find that really hard. So you're always hustling, but once you get an anchor tenant or like a, you know, say like you become a professor or you you're part of a, I don't know, like a think tank or something, you have a place to hang your hat and some like basic income that gets a lot easier. But the other thing is, What's really important is to always think about equity value, not just um, income. Yeah, you need income. You got to pay those bills. But equity value, owning something that can scale when you're sleeping and you can sell someday, that's how you generate real wealth. And so I've had friends who like became freelancers and they freelance and freelance, but then they stop and they have nothing. That's the last income they'll generate the minute they stop. These are the other people who get involved and, you know, maybe become an advisor, get some stock in a company, and then, you know, they actually own something that they can sell someday. Yeah, that's great. I, I think of my very small scale, scale real estate investments as being my entrepreneur 401k. Like, yeah. you know, I have a place in Cambridge and, you know, anything except for a global pandemic will uh, will mean that that place is going to be rented out all the time. We definitely had some some free space in it over the last couple of years. But um, I'm pretty, pretty confident that that kind of equity value will be. No one's putting anything in a 401k for me, so I got to do it myself. Yeah, totally. Um, sounds like Heather's on sabbatical now and she asks any suggestions on how to articulate the sabbatical when beginning to interview again and how to best uh, speak to those career breaks. So I don't know if you had to make an excuse to anyone because you just started working for yourself, right? I guess, you, I mean, you yeah. were taking consulting advisory gigs. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I just want to say, like, I think that the comments from the folks who are commenting, like, they're very interesting and high quality. So thanks, everybody, for the engagement. It's awesome. Um Listen, I think on this one, my personal view, yeah, I kind of like my biggest challenge actually, and I, this is really hard, is like I couldn't explain myself for years. Like literally people had no idea what I was doing until I sort of really sat down and thought about how to describe what I was doing. Because I think sometimes we feel embarrassed or unsure and like, oh, what if people judge me or I'm a failure and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. You have to be unapologetic. I took a sabbatical because I wanted to give myself the space to explore X, Y, and Z. And also I wanted to come into the next phase of my career recharged. If somebody told me that in an interview, I'd be like, Jesus, I want to do that too. You're awesome. Like, you know, I think that's it rather than, you know, kind of being a little bit self-conscious about it. Um, that that's the way to do it. I think it's like, why did I, what did I want to do? How do I achieve it? And what is it giving me for the future? Yeah. And I think, you know, I was talking to someone the other day about how when you're interviewing, really, it's supposed to be a two way street, right? You're trying to figure out, is this a place I want to work? Are these people I want to work for? And for those with the privilege to have the ability to, to shop around and have multiple job offers, if you're talking to someone and you telling them what you just said is a turn off and they don't want to hire you anymore, probably a pretty great kind of canary in the coal mine of how working at that company or for that boss is going to be like. So 100%. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty excited that LinkedIn has set up this kind of career break feature, um, which normalizes it. I mean, I, if you search for people that are currently on sabbatical in LinkedIn, you'll see over 100,000 people on it at any given time. And so I think the more and more people that take it, the more popular it becomes and the more normalized it becomes. Um, so I think that's the, that's the way. It looks like uh, Jim is kind of talking about how like he did the most important work of his life while, while unemployed. And um, I completely agree with that. So great. I, I really appreciate it, Patrick. Looking forward to staying in touch. And um, yeah, we'll have some, some show notes and some, some docs from you, but we'll be following you at FOMO Sapiens. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining today. This was um, a lot of fun. DJ, you're a great interviewer, by the way. Um, <laughs> and um, now you've got me kind of thinking about a sabbatical. We'll see.
Yeah, I'm your commitment device. So in the next five years. All right, done. All right, bye everyone. Take care.